Callum, thank you for coming and it's, it's so great to be interviewing to you today. One, our very first question is about your experience and about what you've seen change over the property industry. So together you have 70 years experience, it's, it's substantial, you both are household names in, in the industry. What have been the biggest structural changes that you've seen in your career? So maybe Carl, I'll start with you. Look, I, I think um, without question, uh, from my point of view, the biggest change in property um, that I've seen over my career, given that I started in, a, in Box Hill in a little house and there was not, not much happening in Box Hill in those days, uh, but it's definitely um, inner city living, high density. And obviously that's something that Cal and I have both been um, very involved in. And personally, I lived in Melbourne Terrace and um, Republic Tower. I currently live in Eureka. And, um, and you just take that for granted now. But when we started, it was quite experimental. And, um, you know, it, it found a niche though. And people really, really started to pick up on living in the city and all of the advantages. And, um, and they learned what a great living option that is. You know, safety, community, everything at your doorstep. Um, and unlike what the naysayers say, you can actually get fresh air. I, I just, I can't even think of a building that doesn't, doesn't have openable windows. And there's all this rumor about open the window and all your furniture gets sucked out. What absolute <laughs> rubbish. Um, mind you, we don't have balconies up quite that high because light plastic furniture might fly out. But um, of course we have fresh air. Um, that is, um, it, it, is very, it is such a massive change. I remember the early 90s when people started building these amazing towers and it, and it was so radical. How about, how about you, Callum? What, what's the biggest structural change that you've seen? Oh, look, I'm, I remember when I graduated from architecture and 40% of taxi drivers were, were architects. Like, um, you know, um, when I remember the, you know, the Gilded Age when, when Victorians were all going to Queensland. You know, I remember when we had a kind of diminishing population and um, and it wasn't great to be a Victorian back then. But I've got to say, I'm very proud Victorian these days. And, um, you know, I think all this started with the amazing work that our universities did in terms of promoting Melbourne as a kind of education city internationally and, you know, domestically as well. And, you know, and I think they drove a lot of, you um, know, in, in a lot of ways, the kind of repopulation of the central city. But, but for me, the biggest change has definitely been um, population growth, because what we've seen with population growth has been incredible, um, uh, you know, embarrassment of kind of opportunities for the population at large and the great um, ability to kind of recast the city in a kind of alternative vision of the city we want to live in. So, you know, like I love Melbourne, I love it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, it's amazing um, Victorian 19th century structure that kind of always have its bones like that. But that, with population growth for me, Melbourne is a much more amazing place than without. Carl, you have a institutional reputation throughout Melbourne's property market and I'm sure with your architectural circles as well. Callum, you have an, uh, a reputation of being more of a disruptor. But both of you have certainly formed Melbourne in your own ways and made it a much better livable, cool city to, to be part of. Um, what would be the biggest changes both of you are advocating for in property? And I want to start with Calm, if that's okay. Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, look, for me, I can't see architecture or any other industry um, without seeing it in the face of a climate emergency. You know, for us, we have, um, so things became very real for us in terms of kind of climate response. And, um, and we have previously done a lot of advocating to our clients to kind of for buildings to be better, but, but not really heard, you know. Now it's kind of so desperate and the kind of challenge is so great that it's all hands on deck in the, in the, built, um, the built environment. Not just new buildings, guys, like existing buildings need to be massively brought into line. You know, not just post COVID-19 in terms of building safety and security, but in terms of, you know, the commitment to renewable energy valve base and, um, and to proliferate a kind of industry of domestic renewable in, um, energy. That really is key, I think, for, um, for the built environment. And Carl, what do you think? Well, obviously, um, Callum and I are very aligned in this. It's, um, 
it's what occupies us. Um, our, our duty to ourselves and community is to make cities a better place. And um, everything that Callum has just said is absolutely uh, relevant and, and, and primary. We have to think about a sustainable future for our cities. We have to think about um, the buildings being um, providers rather than consumers. And we can do this. We have the technology to do this. And, um, and I think we have to think about architects as being mediums for that sort of constructive change. I think um, more and more, uh, the responsibilities on architects are becoming profound. And, um, and we have a, a duty of care, an obligation to make every project we work on. And like Callum said, to really work with our clients to get their attitudinal changes. I think that's happening. Um, and maybe part of that story is also how we build, you know, think about modular systems for more sustainable and more um, quality affordable housing. And think about what COVID has done to us. Think about COVID proofing the buildings and how they're to be used in the future. And, and also, I think we should put into this little basket, think about um, efficient, intelligent pathways through the permit process and understanding the costs uh, to industry of waiting times, which have to be passed on to consumers. So I think it, it's not, there's not one change, it's a whole host of things. And again, in heated agreement with Callum, most of it revolves around um, the changing responsibility of architects to helping make sustainable cities. Carl, we really want to talk to you a bit about apartments and, and how mm -hmm. they've changed over your career. I mean, we know how good the uh, opening windows are. That's, um, that is a key and, and fresh air is something that people love. Um, you know, so what have you seen as the biggest changes over your career? And where do you think apartment design is heading? What are, what are some of the changes that you envision? Yeah, okay. It's interesting. Um, when we did our first apartment buildings in the 80s, uh, Republic Tower, Melbourne Terrace, um, they were apartments really for people that were downsizing from suburbs. It was a limited market. And so they were quite quite large, quite special. Um, we had to do that to get that initial magnetism uh, working. But And we went through phases. We saw a move towards tiny apartments that made them more affordable. They became investment apartments and we're seeing all sorts of iterations of apartments these days. One of the things that um, has happened is people have now become far more used to apartment living and they expect more. Their expectations of quality facilities typologies are very high. I would just say that um, the, the quality of living is really, really important, but it should be available to everybody. And that's something that we're coming to grips with. Uh, I think apartments uh, should not just be offered to a privileged, um, as a privileged option, but it should be a fundamental unit of provision. We have to be able to make apartment living work for all people. Um, do you think CBD living will continue to grow into 2021 when we get out of this lockdown and into recovery? And what is what is it really dependent on for its success? I think we're beyond the days of saying, wow, CBD living, isn't that novel? Whoa, is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? What is it? Of course it will continue to grow. Every major city in the world is based on city living. Melbourne, not so long ago, was a dead city at night time. It was just a working commercial city. I've only lived in two houses in my life. One was my parent, 14 different apartments. It's been apartment living. I've been privileged and loved every minute of it. And am I any different to anyone else? I don't think so. I think it's just a fantastic way of living. People here now know that. And, um, and why wouldn't you want to live in the city, in the most livable city in the world? Of course it'll grow, it has to. It may, it may not be for everybody, but um, again, let's make sure it's affordable for everybody and available for everybody. And I just finished by saying that the great thing about Melbourne is it's not just about apartment living in the city. Melbourne now has got so many different um, ways of living that is, uh, you know, a fundamental choices for people. Live in the country, live in the city, live in the burbs, whatever. 
And that's one of the great beauties of Melbourne, that CBD living is now an important, normal and integral part of life in this fabulous city, and it will keep going. But look, I think a couple of things are going to happen when, um, when we work our way out of this pandemic, which is travel is going to go absolutely nuts. You know, I personally am never coming back home. <laughs> But secondly, the city and the kind of, you know, the great attraction um, to community and culture and events and lifestyle that it has is just going to be, you know, um, a, a so kind of, um, I'm, like I'm missing it, like it's a kind of part of me which I don't have access to. So, you know, I say we're going to go a, a full on in terms of our commitment to our city and our, and our enjoyment of it. I think I'm... Um, you know, that kind of shoulder period it used to be like Carl says in the 80s, everyone went home at five o'clock. You know, a city on the weekend was kind of ghost town. You know, these days I think I'm going to continue to be, you know, maybe working sort of, you know, four days a week and, you know, but hopefully in the city. But I can see my hang around time in the city after work is going to get longer and longer as I kind of do all the things that I have been romanticizing about and really missing. But the city is not dead. The city will be back with a vengeance bigger and better. And luckily, you know, we have this great opportunity to kind of recast that, not where we are at the moment, but well into the future with some kind of more progressive, more exciting models. Uh, on, on to, you spoke a little bit about the office sector, Callum, and I know that you are desperate to get back into the office and really keen to, to be back in the city. I mean, what are the major changes do you expect for, for office property going forward? And there's obviously a lot of landlords that are really concerned that there won't be as many people coming back into the office and, um, and that does have huge implications for our CBD. So, you know, what, what do you think can be done to get people back into the office and, and particularly from a just design perspective? Look, I think um, you've got to look at the population, right? So population at all different ages have very different needs now um, from office buildings. You know, actually younger people have more significant needs um, and older people have more significant needs. I don't know anyone that's going to be back in the office five days a week, nine to five anymore. You know, we've all been forced to learn how to kind of work at home. And so I think what's going to happen is office buildings will need to have a kind of an expanded ground plan that involves kind of work clubs, you know, meeting rooms, boardrooms, kind of, you know, food and beverage assets, child mining, those kind of activities now need to be outside of the general circulation of the building and guests to buildings will no longer come up to your floor. Right, so all me meetings in the future, I think, will be happening in a work club environment around level one. Um, uh, there'll be intensive screening of people to be able to enter any form of, um, of, of commercial property. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, the office floors themselves, if you like, will need all need extensive refurbishment um, to kind of provide for this clustering model, which I think we're, we just have no choice. We have to go with now. Um, uh, but they will be very private floors. Right, so the ground floor and level one, I think have this kind of, you know, real opportunity to become these kind of very fun, very entertaining places to be. We've learned a lot out of all of this. It'll make our office a more flexible place for our for people working and, uh, and, and we'll get some good things out of this. Do you think these changes are gonna last for three to five years or is this a, sh a short term solution to get us back to work? No, I don't think it's short term. I think it will change, but it will feel normal. And so we will work in different ways. It will be part of our consciousness and we'll move on. We always do. We human beings adapt. And I think we've found out ways that we can work more efficiently and ways we can work that help people in very many different situations where perhaps working from home a certain amount of the time is a is a great thing um if we could turn the conversation towards retail i uh, would love to get your views on the future of retail is there too much retail in victoria particularly in some of melbourne strips where vacancy has been climbing pre-covid what will that look like in the future and how would you repurpose some of these vacant shops in the strips and even in the cbd as well yeah look i think um retail in deep trouble is um, you know, you only have to walk through the city to see, you know, what happens to retail without the buildings being open and a lot of businesses, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, have, have fallen, right? Especially 
um, in, in Melbourne. I think people underestimate the degree um, to which this kind of seven month lockdown will have on the population at large is no good. Um, but you know, with it, I'm not sure about the, the strip shopping centers, Zelman. I kind of, I see in them kind of return to more club style facilities where, you know, people take spaces and work together, you know, in kind of more localized shopping environment. There'll be more commercial activities. I'm not sure that will help um, uh, um, uh, retail owners and the kind of rates that they've been used to getting in those streets though. Um, but for the big shopping centers, we've been working on a kind of platform now for, um, for any retail kind of structure that hasn't been significantly refurbished in the last sort of 10, 15 years, they require massive change. You know? It must spread its kind of mind to more of a kind of 24 hour lifestyle and actually provide many more services and facilities than it has been forced to in the past. For small shop owners who own a shop on Little Collins Street, Chapel Street, Turak Road, or, you know, Church Street, Brighton, what could they do to make their shop more lettable and, and, and rely on that sustainable income for longer periods of time going into this recovery? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because um, obviously, and as again, as Callum mentioned, a lot of the strip shopping, uh, Chapel Street, Bridge Road, um, you see a lot of emptiness on those streets. And I think there will be a move um, to um, boutique offices, some form or other, um, where the rents might suit them better. And, um, and that mixture of, uh, of, of commercial office boutique style will then enhance the presence of the, um, the, the retail. So it, it's definitely about mixing it up, not just being a, a sterile, small shopping environment, but really mixing up the uses. And I think that, I think people will really enjoy that. I mean, if you, if you go overseas, what do you do? You don't go to the department stores or shop online. You go into the beautiful little precincts and um, it becomes experiential. You know, the IT environments change the way people shop and that convenience is profound, but the social pleasure of shopping and retailing has gone missing. And there's no doubt that retailers are working on that. They're working on ways of making um, retailing more than just going in and buying your socks. Well, um, on, um, on the hotel, you, you've touched a bit on hotels. So tell us a little bit what your views are in terms of the future of hotels and how they will change um, post what we've got, we're going through at the moment. For me, that's why I kind of keep making the point, for me, our greatest asset as Victorians is our CBD and its culture and its life, right? And there is a great future for hotels in Melbourne that are more attractive and more appropriate for a domestic inbound tourism market and population, right? I also think um, as travellers, um, we're going to want a bit more space between um, other people. And, and, you know, like when I grew up, the hotel, hotels were this kind of mythical, kind of, you know, wonderful edifice where everything was just, um, you know, from the kind of front door all the way through this extraordinary kind of service environment. So for me, hotels will become the safest places in the city to be and to go. And so there is a re there will be a real reason because of the way that they're maintained, the way that they're policed, the way that they're, um, they're, they're, they're constructed. Will be a real reason for people to want to go there to work, to have meetings, um, not just to stay, right? So hotels will serve many um, different functions into the future, but their primary asset, their primary asset will be the investment in the safety uh, and convenience for the population. You know, the kind of tourism industry in general is already going through this massive upheaval if they look at their existing assets. So for me, um, again, like a great, what a great opportunity to kind of reset your hotel asset for the next kind of 20 years of its life. And the first people to do that, that do that now while vacancy rates are low, um, will be the ones that end up with the better performing assets. Um, and it will be a lot less expensive for them to do that. If hotels will most likely be gearing up more for the working at home or the working, the working in hotel syndrome. So the, the, the types of rooms might change to enhance the working environment. I mean, currently we've had a number of clients put a hold on hotels. And, um, but, you know, we don't advise our clients whether to go ahead or not to go ahead. They're huge commercial decisions. And we're certainly not profits of future demand. But, um, and although we've got 
a number of clients who have delayed hotels at various stages, it's going to be buzzing when we come out of this. We'll get our interstate flights back. We'll get our international flights back. We'll get our tourism back. We'll get our business people traveling around again. And, um, and so co with, with commerce and demand, they will come back in some kind of normal. But, you know, when they do, we'll have um, cleaner hands and maybe the opening of hotel doors will be touchless. And, um, but we can say definitely that there'll be a lot of hotel doors opening. In Melbourne, we've all been in and out of ISO since March and uh, it certainly has evolved people. For each of you, what were the one thing about ISO that you're going to miss the most when we get out of this permanently? Oh, look, there are so many things that I'll miss about isolation. I'll, I'll really miss the daily contagion statistics. I'll miss the relentless groundhog quality of each day. The in inability to do what we like when we like. The inability to go to our favourite restaurant the stories of people going broke, the inability of visiting my 93-year-old mother who lives in aged care, and, and the insidious undercurrent of mental health problems. But other than that, um, there's nothing I'll really miss from isolation. I have really struggled in isolation. Right? I'm a very social person and I have really missed people. Um, but, you know, being at home has, um, has given me the great opportunity to have a much more intact relationship, you know, with my family. And, um, and I see that, you know, while I was busy going to work every day for long periods of time, that there was a lot of neglect going on. So, you know, for me, I'm hoping that I can come out of this whole isolation thing a better man and, um, and enjoy a more intact relationship, um, you know, with my kids, my family. But the thing is, the right. thing is, Callum as well, is that, as we do come out of COVID and we do work differently and there is more flexibility, you're now going to be able to have as a norm that kind of family interaction on your own terms. So that that's a good thing. We've re-evaluated we've re our values. Sorry. We've, we've re-evaluated the way we live and what we hold sacred. And, um, and I think that that's probably a positive. We but other than that, it's all shit. <laughs> Nerida, what would you miss the most about this whole ISO? Are you uh, yes. so it's a bit different. Yeah, I'm in Sydney, so yeah, we, I'm, you know, we're pretty, we're starting to get out of it. I mean, I'm with, with Callum, you know, spending so much time with my kids has been awesome. Not travelling has been amazing, but um, but then also I agree with Carl, like it's, yeah, just not seeing people and not, you know, that interaction day to day in the office. I think that's something that will be fabulous when, when that gets, gets back to, to normal. How about you, Zelman? Um, I have a newfound relationship with all my kids and my wife that I, you know, took for granted and didn't appreciate until now. So that is one very positive thing. And I hope, I know it's easy to say now and I can't leave my house, but I hope that I do get to come home for dinner more often because it's something I never, ever, ever did. And it's, it's this little treasure that's waiting there every day. And I always found something more important to do. But um, hopefully at the end of this, I'll you know, realign my priorities and work around them because uh, it certainly changed my family life for the positive, 100%. Um, on to food. Uh, this is a new question that we've put in. Um, food that you've had too much of in 2020. Mine is cheese shapes. I've gotten sick of them now. So I am pleased that I've, I've kicked that habit. Uh, but how about you, Callum? What, what food have you, have you been eating too much of this year? Yeah, the, the particular food I've been eating too much of is called food. <laughs> it's all yep. too available. And, <laughs> and this, this watch here tells me to stand up every hour. So I stand up and where do I go? Magnetic attraction to the refrigerator. I'm really looking forward to, for us to be able to go to a restaurant again, for me to do my business over, you know, lunch or a dinner. I mean, these are part of the joys of doing business. And, um, that's that's not that's not happening. But when it does, again, it'll be enjoyable and it'll take a bit of pressure off Sarah. Uh, yeah, my my eating habits uh, likewise uh, have tended towards that of being a professional eater. I have found myself becoming a little bit more strategic. So I've been um, indulging in chocolate. Actually, more specifically, I've been because I've been craving travel and um, and and consumption so much. I've I've been rereading Nietzsche. 
And um, and this little cafe he used to go to to have every morning is kind of layered chocolate and coffee and milk. <laughs> Right, so I, I like to save that for about two o'clock because my kind of energy levels are running really low. But after that, it's like starting a whole new day. For me, it's been really simple. It's uh, my son and I, we share this passion for ice cream. So Ben and Jerry's cooking cream, um, the cooking cream the with the, with the cookie dough. So we'll take, we'll take every time we, we pass the freezer, we uh, or 7-Eleven or Coles, we, we managed to pick one up and we're pretty serious about it. We just throw the lid off and put the lid in the bin right away. There's no use to <laughs> get our hands on it. That Zoman, sucker's gone. There's no point of survival. Zoman, I've been making Russia Shana Pavlovas. You know, Russia experimenting, Pavlovas. experimenting with the Pavlova with the new season fruits. I've got oh, to wow. say, this is, this is a kind of whole um, regional delicacy that we're having here. The ice cream uh, comment triggered something in my mind. Um, uh, our Fender Katsalidis chairman, Benny Aroni, lives a couple of floors up, so it's often up and down, up and down, up and down. But his wife, Roz, makes ice cream and she's starting a commercial business. And so the sampling of that ice cream has just been fantastic. She make great ice cream and I'm always up there having a bite of ice cream. I do dearly love that. Best TV series anyone's watched over the ISO break? Oh, for me, definitely Fowder, um, oh, yeah. you know, Mark II. Uh, it's been extraordinary. Actually, Israeli Israeli TV has been a real kind of um, been a real thing for us in our household as we've got a lot more focused and specific in the things that we're watching. You, you know, actually look in a fact, little the first bit like place, as soon as you actually look like Doron. <laughs> Doron. <laughs> so as soon as they'll let us out, we're on our way to see our mates in Israel. <laughs> Tell you the truth, I, I don't watch too much TV, but Netflix is, I really enjoy Netflix because you can just tune into whatever's taking your fancy um, at the time. And um, I did see actually a really fantastic doco recently called My Octopus Teacher. And if you haven't seen it, and you really want to reset your values about animals you take for granted, Watch that, it is unbelievable. And um, I think that uh, if you've seen it, you'll stop eating octopus. I don't think anything's gonna stop that. <laughs> Have a look at this movie, it re it's very, very special. Yeah. My, Greek, my Greek friends will come at you with battle axes, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, what's your big idea for, well, what, what do you see as the biggest opportunity over the next 12 months? If you want to be specific, we've really uh, been doing a lot of build to rent as a typology because it suits a need. Um, it, it, it takes it's a it's a an apartment typology that takes this um, stress of um, market sales away from developers and in difficult times with market, they they've all started investigating it and they're finding ways through it. So. I think that that's going to be a significant and much needed uh, type of work. Specifically, we recently won a an amazing, significant architectural competition in Central Place in Sydney. And um, that was in collaboration with SOM out of Chicago. And um, it, it's for us, that means, it, look, it's so significant that it really means that we've got a strong foot now into um, into the Sydney marketplace. And uh, it's it's going to be one that really does change the profile of our Sydney office. But um, I, I think that um, these sort of opportunities um, bring responsibilities. And we've learned through COVID, somehow we've learned through COVID to overnight, how's the homeless? Mm. And um, maybe we need to enact that opportunity now as a matter of course, not as a result of a, of a pandemic. A few years ago, I was in Chicago and talking to the uh, equivalent of the, it was a Chicago's Department of Buildings um, fellow in, in charge and a very innovative, great thinker. And, but he had a simple idea. If you come to me with a building permit and it's for high level sustainability architecture, your permit application goes to the top of the pile. For me, the great opportunity in the next 12 months is, you know, um, personal reinvention. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, for myself and my practice to 
and kind of more more inclusive and more comprehensive. That's a real been a real focus for us for the last sort of five months while we've kind of you know had a lot of time to think and to talk about ourselves. I see this mirrored actually in the built environment. We see kind of um, a great undervaluing of the constructed environment that has happened. A kind of you know kind of like a real tendency to see them as kind of financial instruments um, rather than to look at the great kind of um, opportunity in the fabric of the building and the city at large around them. A lot of, lot of work to be done there at, on ourselves and on the city at large. Our practice really was um, Nanda Katsalides and myself for many years. And um, we've gone through restructuring and so the, all the people that have been there a long time are now owners and directors and uh, we've gone through great structural change in the last three years. We've been really, really fortunate to have just amazing clients and a continuous stream of them. And I think that one of our biggest opportunities, just speaking about our practice, is taking all of those unbelievable disparate talents um, of, of our senior leadership team and uh, melding them into a, a platform for the future that will be sustainable, creative, fair and we're looking we're looking at all of those issues um to with the office more so now than we ever ever have in the past as we were growing growing was surviving and now we're in this beautiful state where we can create a practice uh going forward in the future that is just um the place that um everyone will want to be maybe even as much as they want to be in callum's office <laughs> or perhaps more so carl we look forward <laughs> On behalf of Narada and I, we just want to say thank you very much, both of you, for taking time um, and effort to come on to lead the way and talk to us what to expect in the future, because the two of you are designing and, and providing the ideas to developers on how to build for the future. Um, and it's fascinating to hear what's going through your, 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 your thought process when it comes to all sorts of asset classes that need to make decisions now on what will look like in two to three to five years. So thank you again. We look forward to seeing both of you in restaurants, cafes, and the CBD, in your offices, and um, you know, out, not on a computer screen, but really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And when, when we're in those cafes, we'll be waving our hands. <laughs> Yay! Thanks, Sarah. And thank you, Carl. Thanks for everything. Callum, yeah, see you. Sir. All the best.